You're listening to The Valley Current. Hey, Steve, how you been? I'm good. Is it an end of year crunch or is it easier? It's out of still. I'm very busy with leftovers. We're starting to pick up some planning work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so um, we're keeping quite busy. Um, a lot of the clients are disorganized at this time for various reasons. And, well, there's, uh, there's all sorts of end of year tax strategies, loss harvesting. There's a ton of stuff, right? There is. Um, most of it is for businesses, not um, not individuals. Right. But when you look at it, it's quite a list, right? If you really took it rigorously, like you could buy equipment and take immediate deductions up to whatever the limits are. Like there's all kinds of strategies for... Yeah, honestly, we've got about 20 items on our checklist and each is a trip down the tax land rabbit hole. Right. But what I wanted to talk about, and I sent you the PDF transcript of the oral argument in Moore versus U.S., which is a tax case dealing with the repatriation that occurred during the Trump uh, period in 2017, where it was only about a $15,000 tax bill, but the Moores, a a couple, husband and wife, uh, that had made an investment in a company in India, um, protested and obviously got some public interest group to support all the litigation that has since ensued, including to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the way the press is making it out is, look, if the constitutionality of that act uh, goes against the government, all sorts of negative ramifications are going to play out uh, throughout subchapter F of the Internal Revenue Code. Now, I don't know if you've been following this case, but there are a lot of U.S. citizens that have investments in various companies overseas, and those companies have been able to successfully uh, keep their uh, assets offshore, including Apple Computer and Facebook and a huge number of companies that have overseas operations, they've successfully been able to shield a lot of their assets from U.S. taxation. So I don't know if you've seen these types of cases before, if they come into your practice. Uh, There was kind of a spirited debate in the Supreme Court. I listened to part of it. uh, but, But to my way of thinking, I don't think the court wants to get into this battle, and they probably regret having taken the case is the way I read it, but it was hard for me to discern whether there was any clear majority other than, you know, look, this is pretty complicated stuff. And we don't often get these cases involving the 16th amendment to the U S constitution. Have you been watching this at all? I'm um, only for entertainment purposes. And so that I could be able to um, speak intelligently with clients who have questions about it. I myself don't own a controlled foreign corporation, which is um, what you described as subpart F. And um, the the idea of using the code letter as to which part of the um, revenue code applies just makes things yet another level deeper down the rabbit hole. Right. The story here, as I understand it, is that this company is pretty profitable, the company in India is pretty profitable. And some of the profit is just in cash. So obviously that cash could be distributed and then it would be realized, right? The concept is realization. If the cash were distributed, it would be income because the U.S. uh, taxes on a worldwide basis, right? If you start with that. Hey, Jen, you use the magic word income. And right. whenever that word appears in anything, alarm bells should start flashing. And you should remember this podcast because right. income is a fuzzy word. And well, 
Section 61, if I'm remembering my first year law school, maybe a second year law school, I think it was second year because it was an elective, the, the you know, tax courses, both individual and corporate, uh, were like Section 61 of the code has been there for a long time. And it's fairly broad in saying almost everything and anything uh, can be income. Um, unless, I, unless specifically unless, excluded. And here's a whole bunch of specific exclusions. Right. Every year or two, by the way. Right. Um, so, but it, it's worse than that because when you hear income, uh, the first level down the rabbit hole, is it net income or gross income that's being talked about? And for U.S. income tax purposes, it's almost always net income. But um, go to a state like Washington or Nevada, and they have a gross income tax, which some people consider grossly unfair. Which was just upheld. The one in Washington was just upheld, I think, by the Washington state of Washington Supreme Court. In the back of my mind, I thought I saw that recently. So you've got a whole bunch of industries, such as distribution and um, people who are agents, not principals, and they should be reporting at um, a, a net, not at gross. So then you have um, people who are principals and they report at gross. But um, obviously, if you're doing property management, you know, uh, you get your um, 5% or 7%. And the person who owns a property gets the rest, and you shouldn't be taxed on what doesn't go to you, or it would be grossly unfair to tax a property manager on the entire um, gross revenue of a uh, property she does not own. Right. So, so take the case of the Moors. Right. If you were just yes. looking at Section sixty-one, I mean, if you were just purely looking at that. So let me put it on the screen of the Internal Revenue Code, Section 61 very broadly says, um, except as otherwise provided in this subtitle, gross income. And I know we're dealing with a different subpart, but just the, staying with the general Section 61, it says means all income, so it's a little circular, from whatever source derived, including but not limited to the following items, compensation for services, commissions, fringe benefits, gross income derived from a business, gains derived from dealings in property, interest, rents, royalties, dividends, annuities, income from life insurance and endowment contracts, pensions, income from discharge of indebtedness, which is kind of interesting. Somebody makes you a loan, but then they discharge it, and that's income. Distributed share of partnership gross income, in, income in respect of a decedent. I know that has a special meaning and income from an interest in an estate or a trust, right? And it's pretty broad and it tries to hit upon all these different categories. And the real question is, so if you have a piece of real estate and it's appreciating in value, that's not income. The appreciation just happens in the background, right? If you own a share of stock and the stock goes up in value, you can borrow against those shares. But basically, unless the debt is discharged, there's no income, right? It's all appreciating in the background. Well, yes. And you've just taken us one level deeper into down the rabbit hole. And the issue here, for instance, is um, do we measure income uh, on a cash basis? or an accrual basis, where a cash basis is effectively what we realize. Um, uh, we recognize um, cash basis income when we get paid, um, or um, do we accrue it based upon what's earned but has not yet been paid? Right. And there you get into um, a little uh, nuances like the um, rule for constructive receipt and constructive receipt says that, which is part of the cash basis code, revenue code, it says that you cannot tell your client, hey, don't pay me. I don't want to pay taxes. Just hold on the money another month, another year. You still have to pay taxes. Right. You constructively received on what you earned. Right. But if they can't afford to pay you, then maybe you can delay taxes 
on the claim that um, the income is unrealizable. Right. I mean, I knew I knew criminal defense lawyers who get a kick out of this, but they would say to me, yeah, if my client can't pay me, as sometimes many criminal defendants can because they commit the crime and then they spend the money, but the mother or brother or sister or some relative has real estate, they take a note secured by the real estate as essentially the debt for doing the service work. And then they store that note, like it's a 10 year note into like a future file for their pension. And their argument is, well, I'm doing the services for a deferred payment. And the deferred payment is a promissory note due, let's pretend 10 years or upon sale of the property. So that basically the mother, brother, father, sister, whoever is fronting the fee, instead of paying it in cash, they're paying it in this deferred compensation scheme. And they're like, this is like the best alternative pension scheme in the world, because if it's California real estate and it goes up in value in 10 years, then down the road, it'll be refinanced or sold or something will happen and I'll get my payment with interest because they put interest on the note um, in the future. And they treat that as that's how they fund their retirements when they're defending an individual that can't pay and but he's got relatives that basically will uh, will secure the payment for him. Do you get do you get that that idea of what they're doing? I do. I once did taxes for the estate of a criminal defense attorney. So, um, yes. That works, right? It, yes. And here in USA for um, domestic taxation, individuals by default are on a cash basis, not on an accrual basis. The lawyer who's willing to do work without current pay can defer with security. I mean, he could sell that note and he could sell that whole set of paper, you know, the promissory note, the trust deed, secured arrangement. It represents real value. And in theory, he could pledge it to borrow money against it, just in theory, I suppose, because it's like a you know second trust deed or something. They, there's a market for that stuff. But often they won't. Often criminal defense lawyers will be, I just put it in the file. And it's like another form of annuity paying whatever the statutory rate is in California be 10%. Uh, well, maybe they, lower, maybe they lower the rate, you know, maybe they let's go the- down this hole another level and realize that there's now a valuation problem or question or opportunity. So substitute Bitcoin for California real estate, for example. Or oh, if the lawyer gets Bitcoin? What is a Bitcoin worth? Well, it varies all over the lot, right? It's right. At such high volatility. Uh, I guess it's hitting highs uh, these days, like 45,000 for BTC and I don't know, 2,500 for ETH. Those are the two leading cryptocurrencies. But, you know, in the arrangement I've disclosed, the appreciating note secured by the real estate with an interest, you know, annual interest on it accumulating over time um that kind of represents a deferred annuity to some degree without really any special uh tax provisions other than that well you haven't yet realized the actual cash even though you could you could theoretically sell it at a discount Typically, these second trustee notes carry sometimes a 50% discount or substantial discount for liquidity. But uh, if you don't do that and you just store it away, then at some point you may get a note in your in your mailbox, your, your email box or in your postal mail saying, hey, this real estate sold and here's a check or give us a payoff demand so we can cut you a check and uh, give you a release of lien because we want to sell this property free and clear and you've got to get paid. And that's kind of the day that the final payoff happens. It could happen, you know, far faster than 10 years, depending on whether someone 
renews the note. But the Moors had their investment in this company in India, and the company in India was doing well, but not dispersing any of the cash, not paying a dividend, not making a distribution. So their argument is we don't have the cash to pay for this, right? Yes. But this repatriation statute that went into effect in 2017 said you're going to be treated as though you constructively received whatever could have been the cash distribution. And we're going to tax you on that, which I assume maybe at the numbers that I was seeing, it could have been maybe 60 or 70,000 of which the tax may be added up to, I don't know, look like it was well, at least 15 or 20. That's, that seems unfair for a shareholder who only controls 11% of the foreign corporation. The other 89% shareholders can force the corporation to never distribute income. And to um, if this 11% uh, shareholder is going to uh, be forced out by uh, imposition of these taxes on, there's a word for this type of income. It's not fantasy income, but it's really um, uh, almost fantasy income. Yeah, um, it's almost like phantom income as though phantom, some sort of, yeah, some sort of share certificate was issued or some sort of payment certificate was issued or something else was issued. And I don't think there was any shenanigans. I don't think the company was advancing the money on a loan like there was shenanigans in FTX, where I guess based on tax advice, they were told make loans instead of paying big uh, bonuses to people, make loans to them, make non-recourse loans to them, and they won't have to pay the income tax on it. But down the road, when they find when their stock is worth something, they can sell their stock in FTX and they can pay back the loan and uh, get they get the benefit of the money now uh, based on the loan. Now, of course, the company blew up. So I assume all those loans are getting clawed back. So the loan idea didn't turn out to be such a good idea for those individuals based on the the reckoning that's now playing out there right uh, that's um apparently that's right right um i'm not as familiar with the uh ftx situation but um i have seen phantom income cases where the taxpayer um lacked a good attorney when the original agreements were being drawn up and that let the majority owner force out a minority owner and so uh in any sort of partnership arrangement it's critical to have a good attorney who anticipates the possibility of phantom income being used against minority shareholders. Right. So when you look at these cases that are now dealing with this question of what should happen, do you say to yourself, well, maybe there could have been some better planning around, you know, this section, I think it's section 965 on deemed repatriation of foreign earnings that occurred in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where profits from a foreign jurisdiction to U.S. shareholders would face or do, do face 35% corporate tax, blah, blah, blah. I mean... No, it's, I think it's so unlikely that anybody would have anticipated this going to the Supreme Court that um, I'm not sure anybody could have anticipated a, even a remote possibility that this um, would be ch challenged on constitutional grounds. Or that the Supreme Court would take it, right? Or the do, Supreme Court would even take the case, right? Do the Supreme Court judges understand this accounting stuff? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm kind of surprised. I think they're very confused about how the hell did they end up with this case? Because to my way of thinking, I don't think there was a circuit split. I don't think there was any reason for it other than maybe you could say this is along the lines of the very uh, right wing set of lawyers and public interest groups that are constantly filing petitions that challenge various ways in which um, you might say the left-wing finances, but this wasn't left-wing. This was done by Trump, right? 
I mean, this, this whole thing was handled by Trump. This was not something that was done uh, in the Obama period. It wasn't something that was done in the Biden period. This was during Trump. So I don't get that part of it. And uh, doesn't that, that part didn't make any sense to me. Maybe by breaking um, U.S. revenue generation, they reduce funding to Ukraine. Well, that could be part of it, too. I mean, obviously, we're in kind of a strange period right now because there is still a lot of divisiveness, and I suppose it plays right into the tax code. And if you're pretty wealthy and you've got various interests overseas, then the 35% tax on a deemed repatriation that hasn't really occurred uh, feels painful, right? You know, there's a very interesting history to uh, repatriation of overseas profits. And the uh, Bush administration, the sec second Bush administration, um, introduced a um, holiday, a repatriation tax holiday um, that was intended to generate revenue from the government for the government by re temporarily reducing the taxation on uh, these repatriations. And um, the econ economists concluded that it did not reach its intended purpose. And there's some interesting reading for anybody who wants to go there. So maybe the tax planning thing that the Moors didn't quite get right is maybe they needed to make sure they were under 11% or under 10%. Because isn't there some rule that if you're 9% or less, then you don't have enough of an interest in an overseas entity for there to ever be any form of repatriation deemed or otherwise? Yes. At below 10%, uh, Section F does not apply. Right. So in theory, if you had a foreign entity or a foreign trust or a foreign something and you had like nine relatives or 10 relatives or 11 relatives that were all independent adults and where there's no attribution or control among the relatives, but they all kind of share in the interest, uh, even though collectively they maybe control the entity, but if they each own nine percent then they don't necessarily come within these rules right or if you have a relative overseas who's not a u.s taxpayer right then they can own 91 percent, and you can own nine percent right and right that's perhaps easier to administer than um having to have nine allies right so so when you look at this there probably could have been some better tax planning by the moors it seems like there always can be after the fact Right after the, the 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 tax audit happens, you always look back and say, "Oh, we could have planned around this had we been savvy to it." And that's exactly where your insights come into play, right? And still, um, yeah, nobody would have predicted this, especially for such a tiny amount of money, and considering that half the lawyers are not going to get paid. Right. Um, the the idea that this particular test case would ever um see a daylight as is um, astronomic was astronomically small right i mean i thought the argument that was made on behalf of the taxpayers was pretty good but by the end of it i think he got a little flustered um in his presentation and overall the reading i get is that the court feels like it's in an area where it's really beyond their full understanding and they don't really want to do anything draconian because, you know, it, you got a Congress that is still somewhat divided. And if they declare broadly that the 16th Amendment makes unconstitutional this statute, um, who knows what kind of ripple effect this has and what it does to government budgeting and the like. So I think they're going to be pretty careful here not to do anything draconian and i don't know it seemed by the end that the lawyer for the moors was like well maybe you could narrow it this way or narrow it that way because he must have gotten the sense in the oral argument that he didn't really have a majority he may never even had even one of the justices on his side 
it might have been like, look, we granted certiorari here, but we're really not sure that we want to touch this. And so I, I enjoyed reading the first 10 pages of the transcript. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and some of the justices' questions I'm remembering are, um, but wouldn't uh, wouldn't this interfere? Wouldn't a change in this area interfere with this part of the code? Wouldn't a change in this area interfere with some other part of the code? Right. And, I mean, yes. I mean, the, the code is, is is it, the code is the Internal Revenue Code, but it really is like software. It really does have. Like you change one line of the code or you change the interpretation or the constitutionality of one aspect of the code dealing with this concept of realization. And all of a sudden you have a ripple effect throughout the rest of the code that generates a lot new litigation and a lot more good faith positions by various taxpayers that changes a lot of outcomes or potential outcomes, right? Right. So Maybe. Steve, Steve, going on the planning front to wrap up on the planning front, my sense is the Moors didn't really have a, a tax planner, ended up with a situation where they were just upset enough to complain to enough people that the word got out to the public interest groups that were interested in taking up a case for them. And then they ran with it. And, and uh, they're probably not paying all the legal fees associated with it because just wouldn't be cost effective to do it. But it's kind of like these are the test cases that finally make their way. But most of the rest of us don't really do that. We rather engage in the planning. Now, maybe in this case, the amounts of their investments were just too small to really decide to do the planning. But you get planning done relatively quickly and relatively inexpensively so it's, um, the cost benefit of doing tax planning is probably um the place where our clients make the most money and we lose the most money because um we can charge a few hundred dollars for some advice that ends up saving clients a few million dollars yeah, I mean, people don't realize that the return on investment of having someone like you look at their situation and say, right off the bat, I see 10 things that you could change and instantly improve your position on audit or otherwise um, is amazing. And that's why I thought sort of bringing this to folks' attention in the context of the Moore case, which I think is an unusual case, Moore versus U.S. that we've been talking about, argued earlier this week, um, overall, people need, just like they need a good medical doctor, a good dentist, a good lawyer, they need a good accountant and a good... Yeah, let me planner. let me throw out three freebies. Um, if you, you or somebody you know has what's called a bypass trust, AB trust, ABC trust, um, then it probably should be reformed. And you'll need not only an accountant, but an attorney to help you with that. If you don't reform it, when a second spouse dies, you lose um, step-up basis. You could easily lose a couple million dollars of step-up basis because um, assets do not step up in basis if they are owned by an entity. They have to be owned by an individual to step up in basis. Right. So, so that's a, point one. An AB trust that has a piece of residential real estate in it could lose the step up basis which can be significant my neighbor recently died he has a property it's probably worth 10 million i think he bought it for three hundred thousand. that's like 9.7 million of step up basis that can get destroyed it's I only think. half um because it's the first spouse portion that gets separated into the the b trust and it's a step up basis on that portion that's owned by the trust that gets lost but right. um, if you you or somebody you know, perhaps an elderly relative who um, did their living trust 10 years ago and has never revisited it, um, is in a situation you should really think about perhaps reforming a trust or taking other measures. Um, i give you two more. Yeah. Um, I, there's still, I just did a tax return for somebody who saved nearly $100,000 by buying a very heavy vehicle. She bought herself a tank um, to 
uh, take people on real estate showings. And um, because it's over 6,000 uh, pounds gross vehicle weight, um, the accelerated depreciation is amazing. Um, well, what you buy? What you buy? Like a big SUV kind of thing? It was actually a Tesla. Um, a Tesla um, Model X, I believe, is over Mo- six. Model X. Uh, Model X. I bo- I'm, I hope I'm correct on that. Yeah, that's the big. Uh, that's the big. That's the big SUV model. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, idea savings idea number three: Stop billing your clients this month. Right. You can defer it into next year. Right. Shift. I shift a, year, a, a month's worth of income into the subsequent year. So, right. Um, I, I set up a, a, um, a planning session with us for more suggestions. We've got about 20 suggestions that are like this or, um, uh, and can have significant benefits. Right. Well, thank you, Steve. I think you're, you're brilliant on this stuff and I always recommend you to people. So tell people how they can reach you. Thank you, Jack. Um, and a good attorney is also essential and you are an excellent attorney. And I think I, I introduced two people to you recently. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Most welcome. Um, I can be reached um, on my cell phone at 408-887-6433 or by email at srabin, that's S-R-A-B as in Bravo, I-N at srabin.com. Again, Great. srabin at srabin.com. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for your time tonight. You take care. I'm sure we'll talk before Christmas, but it's good seeing you. And we'll look forward to the next time we talk. Take care. Sounds great. Happy holidays. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.